Rebecca, we are ready to go. Good morning and welcome. My name is Rebecca Bill Chavez. I'm president and CEO of the Inter-American Dialogue. And we're so glad that you're joining us um, at this critical juncture in Peru. So today's discussion is part of a series that the Inter-American Dialogue um, is having about the future of democracy in the Americas. We're so fortunate to have Michael Shifter here to lead the discussion. As I think probably everyone knows that Michael served as the Inter-American Dialogue president for over 12 years, and um, he has deep experience in Peru. So I look forward to hearing his insights and those of our excellent panelists on Castillo's very Fujimori-like attempted autogolpe and the turbulent aftermath of the past few days. We're also gonna have the opportunity to hear about the future of democracy in Peru, as well as implications for democracy across the region. With that, I don't wanna take up any more time. I know we have a lot, to, a lot to learn today from our experts. So I'm gonna turn it over to Michael to introduce the panelists and start the discussion. And thanks again to all of you for being here. Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca, and good morning to everybody. Uh, buenos dias a, a todos y a todos. Um, the term crisis is often overused, but I think it's a fair description of Peru today. The situation is very grave by any measure and should be of concern to all of us. The country is now under a state of emergency for, over 30, for the next 30 days. A decision taken by President Dina Boluarte in response to nationwide protests, massive chaos, and violent clashes with police that have resulted in eight deaths, 100 injured, and significant property damages. The protests erupted shortly after Boluarte took office on December 7th and announced that she would complete a, the five-year term of Pedro Castillo, who had been impeached by Congress earlier that day after he attempted to, to subvert the Constitution, close the Congress, and take over the judiciary. Elected in 2021, Castillo represented for many Peruvians a call for greater social justice in a country marked by deep inequalities and high levels of poverty and exclusion. But from the outset, it was clear that, that the job of president for the inexperienced outsider in the land of the outsiders was too big for Castillo. And he was increasingly dogged by accusations of corruption, a thread that runs through recent Peruvian administrations, indeed, much of the country's history. There had been two previous attempts to impeach Castillo. Although the recent protests reflect a variety of demands, including immediate new elections, the closing, a Congress, closing of the Congress even less popular than Castillo, a new constitutional assembly, the resignation of Boluarte, seen by many or some at least as illegitimate, and the freeing of Castillo, what is clear is that many Peruvians are angry at the entire political class for continued corruption and a failure to address basic needs. And perhaps the greatest tragedy is that even with new elections, it is not entirely clear who would be able to steer the country on a more stable democratic course. In an attempt to calm the country, Boluarte, who was the sixth president of Peru since 2016, has now proposed to hold elections as early as a year from now, in December of 23, although other members of her government have said that it would be possible to do so before April 2024 because of technical problems. There's still a lot of confusion and lack of clarity about when elections might be held. Another pending question is the trial and sentencing of Castillo, who from jail has lashed out at the country's political elites and has encouraged the mobilizations throughout the country. I believe that today, in fact, Castillo, there's an audiencia with Castillo um, and lawyers to talk about uh, his uh, his situ his legal situation in Peru. So this is a very tense, fast moving and confusing situation. There are many questions we want to explore this morning, including what are the main factors behind the current crisis? How have different actors like political parties, the right and the left, civil society, the private sector, how have they performed? Have they made the situation better or worse? Uh, how do we see Boluarte? 
as the uh, president became was vice president became president upon um, uh, Castillo's impeachment. Uh, will she will how how stable is her presidency? Uh, will calling early elections uh, help quell the unrest that we're seeing throughout the country? Out the country, many have talked about political reforms, changing the constitution. Is that the right answer? It is even feasible in the current circumstances. Um, many have talked, have noted that um, despite all the turmoil and the unrest, Peruvian democracy is holding, which is no small feat. Is this, should we celebrate Peruvian democracy? Uh, how do we assess its strengths and weaknesses? We'll also look at the international reaction to Peru's latest crisis? How have other Latin American governments responded? How does the international community see the situation in Peru? And finally, uh, very important to talk about the what's long been uh, characterized as the Peruvian paradox, the uh, political instability, which is not new in Peru, at the same time with economic stability, which we've seen over the last several decades. Uh, to what extent do the current circumstances and the current crisis put that co coexistent, coexistence at risk? Um, will the macroeconomic results, outcomes of Peru, which have been pretty positive, uh, will that continue if the political crisis persists? So we're very, very fortunate this morning to have three outstanding analysts to share their insights and perspectives about Peru, on about these and other questions, and where the country may be headed. Roxana Barantes is with us. She is the principal uh, professor of economics at the Catholic University in Peru. She's also a senior researcher at the Instituto de Estudios Peruanos, a major think tank in Lima. Uh, she has a PhD from the University of Illinois in economics. Farid Kahat is a senior lecturer at the Department of Social Sciences, also at the Catholic University. He's a columnist um, for a Comercio, and also uh, America Economia, and he has his doctorate from the University of Texas uh, at Austin in government. And, and finally, a uh, very uh, close friend and good friend of the dialogue who is uh, who has contributed her perspective and analysis on, on, on different moments of crisis in Peru. Uh, we're very happy to have Cynthia McClintock, who's a professor of political science and international affairs at George Washington University. She's a former president of LASA, the Latin American Studies Association, and Cynthia has her doctorate from uh, in political science from MIT, and of course has written many books about the politics uh, in Peru. So I wanted to thank, we really have three extraordinary uh, speakers, and um, I want to let everybody know that um, we welcome your comments and your questions, and you can submit those questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom, or you can email us at meetings at the dialogue.org. And before I turn it over to Cynthia to get us started, I just wanna thank Gaston Ocampo for his uh, support and assistance in, uh, in, in coordinating uh, this meeting uh, with our speakers and all our participants. So with that, we look forward to a good discussion and let me turn it over to Cynthia McClintock. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Thanks for this invitation. And it's great to be here with everybody. Although I wish, you know, the news were were a lot better. We're all you know, very worried uh, about Peru and its uh, future. The immediate catalyst of the crisis is very clear. Uh, you mentioned, Michael, you know, Castillo's attempt at an autogolpe. Uh, no, this couldn't have been uh, clear. It was on national television, a statement that he wanted to rule by decree. Uh, it's very distressing uh, to me that uh, Mexico, you know, Bolivia, Colombia, Argentina has not recognized uh, that and is continuing to recognize Castillo despite uh, his uh, attempt at an alto golpe, which as he's, was mentioned, you know, it takes us back to the to the Fujimori years. Um, it's certainly the case that the rightist opposition in Peru's Congress was recalcitrant, that it wanted uh, Castillo gone even before he got there. Um, it was also clear that they had often flimsy charges against him that uh, made it very, very difficult for Castillo, but that does not negate the fact that he entered into an attempt uh, at an alto golpe, and it does not negate the fact that he uh, governed very badly. Uh, he governed very badly. And 
I think what we've seen in the first few days of the Boluarte presidency is, you know, what Castillo could have done at the start that there was one question there, was this inevitable or not? No, I think she has shown that, you know, it was not. Uh, I think, you know, unlike Castillo, she has shown that um, she understands the political moment in Peru. She understands where she's at. And as you mentioned, Michael, she uh, has gone from saying elections in 2024 to elections in 2023. We're, we're open to this. We, 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 we want to work with people. We're listening to these uh, demands. Um, she has built bridges with the Congress. There were some accusations against her at the start, and that was all kind of so she's she's shown that she can build these bridges. And very, very importantly, uh, unlike her predecessor, she appointed ministers who were qualified for their positions, you know, who had backgrounds in what they were supposed to be doing and who came from diverse parties. And again, she seems to understand that, you know, this moment, uh, you know, when there was such a strong rightist representation in Congress, that it was important to build these uh, bridges. And I think we all thought that Castillo would do that at the start. He gradually moved in that direction, but it was uh, too little, uh, too late, uh, in my view. But of course, the bigger question right before us, is, as has been indicated, is can Bolor take control of the situation, what will happen if, if she can't. As I said, we're all you know, very worried, as, as you said, Michael, these uh, continuing uh, continuing protests. And as, and as you said, this reflects things way beyond Boluarte. It reflects these, this longstanding uh, problems of poverty and inequality, the failures of repeated governments to do enough to redress poverty and inequality. And of course, all of that exacerbated by the pandemic, by relatively low economic growth. Um, clearly, protesters are, you know, I think, as you mentioned, too, the issue of, I think that Pedro Castillo had uh, kind of built uh, ties with uh, Tarahumala. Uh, Tarahumala is particularly strong in some of these areas in the southern highlands where these protests uh, began. Uh, Tarahumala would like to run for the presidency. Uh, so there's that political component, too. But that does not change the fact that there's no longstanding uh, generalized anger in the sense, too, I think, which you didn't mention, Michael, that, you know, that there have been these allegations of corruption just sort of endlessly the last couple of years, and yet very few prosecutions, very few, you know, uh, actual indictments of this sense that where is all this heading? And then, of course, Castillo with so many allegations of corruption uh, against him. Uh, what's not clear is if the protests continue, would there be an impeachment of Boluarte? In that case, the presidency shifts to uh, Jose Williams, who is the current Congress speaker. And what would that mean? I fear that that would mean more protests. Uh, I fear that it would mean Williams, uh, he is a retired uh, general. I fear it would mean a closer incorporation of the military into Peru's government, and that that could lead us on a very slippery slope that I don't think any of us uh, know, want to uh, want to see. Um, and you asked me in particular to speak about Peru's military, and I say in general, you no, know, the last, you know, since uh, 19, uh, 1980, Peru's military has said, no, we don't want to go there. Uh, it was difficult to govern from 68 to 80. We want to maintain our institution. Uh, but I don't think it can be discarded that there would be at this point, given the level of protests in the country, that the military would be kind of saying, hey, know what's going on here. And we have to recognize that the right has gained a lot of strength in Peru. Um, those of you uh, not too familiar, recent uh, subnational elections, a, a rightist populist, Rafael Lopez Aliaga, won the mayorality of Lima. So there are these strong rightist currents uh, in the country. And of course, as we've mentioned, the right strongly represented in, in Peru's Congress. Um, so you asked about the economy. Uh, for many years, the political instability didn't affect Peru's economy, but this level of uh, crisis obviously is, you know, with mining areas being severely damaged, tourist areas being severely damaged. So again, the concern that if this is ongoing, uh, that's very, very problematic. Uh, in terms of reforms and changes, uh, I would hope for an electoral reform that uh, requires an additional round of voting if no candidate wins 30 percent of the vote. Uh, there is this serious concern that, again, we end up with Antaro Mala uh, versus Keiko Fujimori because they both have certain political bases of around, let's say, 20 percent. But then you have all these other 12 candidates, more or less centrist. And if you have a top five, at least there can be some strategic voting to get 
uh, a candidate with a little bit more broader uh, support uh, in in uh, power. No, there's no reform I think on the on the horizon that can suddenly give Peru strong political parties. Uh, there has not been a political party that has been able to elect a second president from its own ranks in Peru since 1915. There's never been a strong political party in Peru since the turn of the 20th, end of the 19th, 20th century. And Peruvians are very critical of their presidents. The, in the Latina barometer polls from 2002 to 2018, uh, approval ratings of Peru's presidents were the lowest of any country in Latin America. So it's hard for Peruvian parties to have the kind of support. And, you know, this is ongoing problem and it's not going to change tomorrow, unfortunately. I wish I could say yes, but I don't think so. So thank you very much. And um, thanks again for the invitation. I'll pass, the, pass it on over. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Cynthia. That was that was terrific. Thanks for getting us off to a great start. And let me turn it now to uh, Roxana for her perspective. Roxana. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really um, a pleasure to, to join this um, extraordinary panel. Uh, the circumstances are extraordinary, and, but sad at the same time. So um, I prepared some remarks and also would like to, to react to what um, some points about uh, Cynthia's uh, points just made. Firstly, this uh, dilemma uh, in Peru about the politics being uh, on the one side or uh, and the economy on the other. And so on the positive, uh, I was just amazed about how the exchange rate has reacted uh, aligned to what the Federal Reserve in the U.S. is doing instead of uh, on the political, uh, on the internal political turmoil. That is just amazing. During the 90 minutes, less than a soccer match, in the World Cup nowadays with all the extensions that the referees are given, um, which are just new to us. Anyway, um, during those 90 minutes uh, a week ago on Wednesday, December the 7th, uh, there was spike in the exchange rate, but it uh, really uh, ended up lower than what started at nine in the morning. So if you bought dollars at 4 p.m. on Wednesday, December 7th, uh, you made a deal uh, compared to what happened at 9 a.m. and even much better at uh, noon. So firstly, it seems the exchange rate is not reacting as a, a symbol of um, instability. First. Second, Peru uh, nowadays, although inflation, the inflation rate is, is high, is, it is uh, well out of the range that monetary policy wants it to be. It is one of the lowest in the region. And the policy that the central bank implemented of raising interest rates really on uh, 25 basis points each time um, has smoothed our uh, adaptation to the stringent financial instability uh, worldwide. So those are the pluses, plus, plus, plus. What is the minus? The minus is, um, and it's a huge one, it is the weakening of private investment. And this is going on since Castillo took power last year. Uh, the second semester in 2021 saw the highest outflow, capital outflow in Peru. And it was mainly Peruvians 
taking uh, capital out of dividends of their own companies in, in a big and important way. And that happened last year. And since then, private investment has not recovered at all. And that is coupled with no major mining project uh, inside. And major mining projects in, in the Peruvian economy are very important because those are like the, the, um, the speed that the economy needs in order to uh, go on. In the last two minutes that I have is, uh, Cynthia has already mentioned about what is going on with tourism, which was supposed to be uh, making a recovery, but this political stability is uh, really, if you like boxing, it's like a knockout for tourist activities. And those employ a lot of people and that people will be hurt. And the, the elephant in the room is, is food insecurity. Many Peruvians are facing a really lack of food in order to make more than one meal a day. And that is, uh, that is uh, really, uh, and this three has not been addressed by the Castillo government. And so uh, I read uh, some days ago a comment saying Castillo is showing his comparative advantage. He's very good as a demonstrator and a leader in the opposition rather than a, go um, a leader in the executive power. He didn't do anything. He didn't even supported his economy ministry, minister when Pedro Franque wanted to pass legislation for a tax reform. He didn't even do that. And so um, I will leave for uh, as, um, another, another uh, intervention. My impression, and I'm, now I'm stepping into Cynthia's, Michael's, and Farid's uh, terrains, uh, areas of expertise, it seems that this was this coup uh, last week, which we all heard, was Plan B uh, designed from the start. And I could go on uh, expanding this in in another, um, in another moment. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Roxana. We may have to pick up on that last comment about you know what was Plan A, but um, why don't we turn it over to, uh, to with that tease? Let, let's turn it over to Farid for his uh, his comments and his perspective on the situation. Farid, hi, thank you. Well. Um... If I started saying that there is a crisis of representation in Peru and a crisis of the party system, someone might ask what's new about that? I mean, it's happening all over the world. I would say that Peru is an extreme case, even in a region like Latin America in which those problems are prevalent. Uh, I'll give you just one example and I, don't think there is a, a, a comparable case anywhere in the world. The last four run, uh, ruling parties, Toledo's, Garcia's, Umala's, Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, the, the last four ruling parties did not present a presidential can, candidate in the next general election. I don't think there is a case like that in the world. So that gives you an idea of how extreme the, the, the crisis, both of representation and of the party system is in Peru. I would say there is a regional element imported to the Peruvian conflict. There is a polarization in which the political rivals do not have legitimate uh, demands 
uh, or positions, but they are perceived rather as existential threats. And because they are perceived as existential threats, you are you don't grant them the same uh, rules that you think should uh, be the ones organizing the political interaction. Uh, that in turn has to do with the fact that Latin America went through uh, two left turns, not for ideological reasons, but the fact is that the left either couldn't compete or couldn't govern in the past. If, if they did compete and won elections, usually they were deposed by military coups, like in Chile or Brazil, Chile 73, Brazil 64, and there are other examples. In the 21st century, the left for the very first time in the continent, or at least in Latin America, uh, could win and govern. And uh, some left-wing parties, while in government, were both radical in terms of economic policies and authoritarian politically. So when you talk about the existence of a radical right in Latin America, you have to add to the conditions that defines it in the Europe or the US, the fact that um, the radical right in Latin America has a stronger anti-communist component because uh, the radical right in Europe, for example, emerged when the traditional left was on retreat, the social democratic parties, electorally speaking. Here it emerges, the radical right, when the left was obtaining its best uh, political or electoral outcomes in the region's history. And twice in a single uh, period of uh, 22 years so far, this century. So that explains why very basically there's a problem of constitutional hardball. I mean, the rules of the game are used for partisan game, both uh, by the left and by the right. And in the case of Peru, that has become even worse than the last six years. For example, between 1993, when the current constitution uh, became the law of the land and 2016 the the so-called vacancia por incapacidad moral permanente the category used to uh, basically depose castillo was used only once in a period of over 20 years since 2017 and this year it has been used seven times more than one once per year and it ended up with three presidents out of power. And two of those presidents, as a preventive measure, tried to close Congress because before Congress deposed them. Um, one successfully won Castillo unsuccessfully. Uh, the International Commission on Human Rights basically pointed the finger to these rules that have been abused lately, but the uh, vacancia por incapacidad moral permanente, meaning that the president could be deposed for uh, what is called uh, permanent moral incapacity. That was understood originally as that as mental uh, incapacity, but now it has become a category that, since it's not well defined in the constitution, could be used basically as a political tool against the current president. Um, and the same with the figure, the International, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights say the same thing about this figure, the um, disolución del Congreso por negativa de dos uh, mociones de confianza, that the Congress can be dissolved or uh, uh, closed uh, because it denies the government uh, a confident vote if for two consecutive cabinets. That cabinets. That was the way it was originally intended to, to work. But since it's not well defined in the Constitution and the Commission highlights that, um, it has been abused as well. And um, in that context, um, you have both the left and the right playing this constitutional hardball. Uh, there's a law for against the left. I, I do think that's true. 
For instance, Petro took his case to the Inter-American Inter Court of Human Rights and won. Uh, Lula was the victim. I mean, that doesn't mean that Lula is innocent, but Lula was the victim of a rigged process against him, so he could not run. So it is true that there's so, such a thing as a lawfare against the left in some cases, but the left basically took that to mean that whenever a left-wing president is in trouble, must be because of that. And I would argue that that's not the case of Castillo at all. Castillo did try to perpetrate a military coup, was an utterly corrupt government, and wasn't progressive in any meaningful sense of the word. So I think there is a, I will end with this. There is a, a very distorted image of what happened in Peru uh, coming from the regional left. Great, thank you very much, uh, Fari, for those uh, very interesting uh, comments. Um, we have a few minutes. I'm gonna first of all let me just remind everybody that if they want to, you know, submit questions uh, or any comments, just use the Q and A function on Zoom, and we'll get to your questions in a moment. But I, I just wanted to maybe just follow up with the three speakers and some questions. Let me start with with with, with Cynthia. I mean. Um, Really, two questions here. One, one is one is you mentioned uh, Boluarte and that she really showed she's demonstrated what Castillo didn't. And you're right; I think her cabinet is, uh, although there have been some mixed reviews compared to compared to Castillo's cabinets, I think they're of a higher uh, a higher level. But that was a low bar um, uh, in terms of competence and and so forth. But you know, some commentators have said that really what she might have done, of course, constitutionally, she when she assumed the office, said she would fulfill the mandate until 2026, which one understands. But I think some of the some of the some of the comments have been that she might have kind of couched that within a sort of a broader political message um, of why you know it was important to kind of you know you know the, to the to the country about what she was doing uh, about uh, you know uh, you know that that she really needed to and then when she's when she's changed now to bring it up earlier to twenty twenty four or even twenty twenty three you know really sort of a lack of communication in other words to say that we hear uh, we understand that the population you know, wants elections now because all the polls show that's what that's what Peruvians wanted. And so she was assuming this, this office and saying, I'm going to fulfill the mandate, which was in tension with what the with the sentiment within the Peruvian population was, which is they wanted, you know, and she didn't really address that. And I just wonder, you know, whether one might say that that would have been helpful if she had kind of sort of taken that into account from the beginning in a message. And the second point is, I was just wondering, you mentioned uh, Ataro Umala a little bit. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about not, maybe not everybody knows exactly who he oh. is. And also, um, you know, just a little bit more about what his strategy might be in this context because you know i get emails from people saying so is it true that Ataro Malas could be the next next president of peru and so maybe just maybe another word or two about him and what he what his calculations may be thanks sure oh no thank you thank you uh, a lot a lot to uh, respond to there um with respect to Bolorte and, and her cabinet i think we have to keep in mind that a lot of really qualified people might not want to join a cabinet at this point too. know that it's tricky because there are so many fears, what kind of directions. And so, I mean, this was definitely a problem for Castillo after point two, people say, ah, this could be a sinking ship and lots of problems that I'm not going to take it. So it's, you know, not that easy. Uh, I agree with you with respect to kind of, I mean, it was very clear. I mean, the, the central dilemma right now uh in a lot of these political calculations in Peru is that Peruvians believe that the 2021 elections for both president and Congress were terrible. They were in the midst of COVID, accidental outcomes and results, and they want a do-over. And it's all very uh, reasonable. But I don't think this was brought up quite enough. Peru's Congress, if they're immediate elections because they're even less popular than the president, as you mentioned, Mike. So they have to go to re-election and they are not allowed to run. So the Congress is 
would really like to keep their jobs. And my mm-hmm. own guess is that Bolarte, you no, know, the thought a couple of months back was that Bolarte would not last at all because there was already charges against her for the sort of conflict of interest when she was head of the Club de Aparimac. Uh, and apparently there were these sort of deals negotiated. So I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know this, but my guess offhand is that you know, she had discuss- discussions with Williams and others and kind of saying this is going to last, that they want this to last. You know, at least segments of them want this, uh, want her government to last so that they don't have to go uh, mm-hmm. to new elections. So in other words, it's very complicated, but she had to know, as you said, that the overwhelming demand of Peruvians is for new elections now. So it's tricky. I mean, I think, again, to her credit, she said sure, earlier, and it's hard. I think you mentioned these issues about, you know, that it is tricky to have the elections too soon because the parties have to register and who are going to be the candidates and can they position themselves in time. So it's it's quite complicated. And I guess that gets us to Antaro uh, because he, uh, Antaro Mala, for those of you who are not familiar with this, he uh, is the brother of Oyanda, who uh, was uh, Peru's president from uh, 2011 to 2016, and um, uh, to- together they had kind of launched this. They they had had a protest against Fujimori, and then Antaro in 2005 led what was called the Andahuaylaso uh, against the Toledo government, and this was a rebellion in which. Uh, uh, I think two or three people from the security forces were killed and Antaro uh, was imprisoned. Uh, but he did have this base. And I think I might have mentioned that some of these first protests were in Andahuaylas, which is that same area from Antaro. So he has been organizing there. And there is this belief that there are quite close ties between him and Pedro uh, Castillo. Uh for my own part, I do not see Antaro Mala being the next president of Peru. Uh, no, he's a. It's the, it's the back to the original kind of ethnocasarismo ideologies of the copper race, and I don't see this uh, having anything like. Fifty percent of the vote. That said, he obviously is able to be a factor in protests and have it has a mobilization capacity at least, you know, in certain more remote parts of Peru. One thing we haven't mentioned, which I think is relevant, is that Boluarte does hail from Apurímac, again a remote highlands part of Peru, and so again, sort of passing this mantle to Jose Williams, a retired general, could create even more again a sort of sense of protest and disenchantment by a lot of those sectors that you know are now sort of expressing anger but may not be pondering all the results of this pro these protests okay great thank you uh roxana um let me turn to you i have a few questions um uh, for you one one is the you know this this drop in um you know in foreign investment that you that you referred to is this you know a, this is the basic product of just a sense of complete insecurity in Peru and, you know, it's kind of the protests and blockages and so forth, the unrest, or is this because of, you know, unhappiness with Peru's economic policies and economic management, um, you know, they have, and they've had, despite everything, seem to have competent, you know, uh, economic ministers and they have a good person in the central bank and you know and, and so just wondering what that is also we haven't mentioned china you know which obviously has an important role in peru and the economy can you say a word about how how you think china is seeing the situation in 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 peru and, and finally you know um we're all on the edge of our seats to hear about what plan a was if um uh, you said this was well, this was Plan B. If you want to go a little bit further in that, thanks. Thank you. Um, regarding investment, I want to say it is because we have um, best competent uh, economic policy officials. It is not because of that. The problem is in the rest of the sectors. If you want to build a major commercial. Uh, a major outlet, you need to go to the Ministry of uh, Housing and then to the local government and then to somebody else. And that is where the the major weakening in state capacity is being seen. 
And with Castillo, I was going to plan A, with Castillo, that turned out to be uh, even piecemeal uh, side payments. Right. So plan A, and this is, uh, I'm stepping into That's okay. <laughs> somebody else's expertise. Plan A was let me be in charge. Let me do what I think a, a, a leader uh, in power should do, which is get the public monies the most. Um, for instance, we are not saying anything about how the current um, uh, police, uh, colonels and generals got their, their positions. There are allegations that they bought those positions. How did they get the $20,000 to buy their positions? Out of getting uh, money from everybody who is uh, doing the outside patrol, okay? And so that is plan A. That is why whenever the OECD mission was in, in town, Castillo would say, we want you to be part of the OECD. Mm -hmm. And we are, as you know, Farid put it so clearly, Castillo was a progressive in any meaningful sense of the word at all. He wanted just to, you know, hacer uh, el muertito. I don't know how to say that in English. Play uh, dead. Excuse me? Play dead. Yeah and be unnoticed. Mm -hmm. As soon as he got notice in his, you know, piecemeal uh, corruption de uh, dealings, he started plan B, which is try to overcome Congress, rule by decree, and when that went wrong, just a hypothesis, he activated all the, the, the network of uh, local officials which he appointed. And just Saturday, December the 3rd, he designated as vice minister to in charge of social conflict, a lawyer who is related to Moade, Fancenate, and the most extreme parts, Nolesilla, um, uh, if I don't remember uh, incorrectly his name. Uh, uh, so this person was appointed by Castillo on December 3rd as the major Peruvian official in charge of solving social conflict. So, this wasn't Castillo was drugged, was under drugs or anything. This, I think, hypothesis, I leave it on the table. Um, China, I'd rather, I'm stepping too, <laughs> way too far off my area <laughs> of expertise, rather keep quiet. Okay, all right. <laughs> Thank you. I think, uh, let me just underscore a point that you made, which doesn't get enough attention that one, which I think is exactly right. Um, you said at the beginning is sort of the hollowing out and, and the reduced capacity of the state under Castillo. And I think if one asks the question, what is one of the impacts of his, you know, year in office? Um, I think by all accounts, that is, that really stands out. And I think it's it's you know that's that's one of the things in whatever scenario moving forward is going to have to be addressed by whatever government um, to improve you know because the state capacity was has always been an issue in Peru uh, as we know but uh, weak state capacity but it's got a lot worse under under Castillo and that I think you're right I think had an effect on foreign investment so I'm glad you you raise you raise that question so thank you uh, Fareed. Um, let me just go to you for a quick question. I mean, you, you, let's just try to sort of, you know, sort of ground this a little bit when you talk about the right in mm -hmm. Peru, so that people know what the right is in Peru. Uh, is it Keiko Fujimori? 
Um, is it, you know, I mean, there's lots of different sort of political actors, political parties. Uh, as we know, there's enormous fragmentation in Peru. Um, you know, how should we think about what the right is, or for that matter, what the left is in, in Peru? I mean, can you break it down a little bit and just kind of identify what the different parts of both of those sort of broad factions are? Um, well, uh, just let me just qualify something I said in answering to your question. The right is mostly authoritarian as well. For instance, just right. like Bolsonaro in Brazil and Trump in the US, they didn't recognize the legitimate electoral victory of Castillo. Um, all of the right? All of the right then? Uh, mo all of the parties that you could easily okay. identify as, as right wing. I mean, yeah. what do you call APP or uh, right. Podemos Peru? I don't know, transactional parties. But Avanza País, um, Renovación Nacional, and uh, Fuerza Popular, what you may clearly identify as the, as the Peruvian right, they all uh, denied uh, that there was a legitimate, uh, legitimately elected president. Mm -hmm. And Avanza País was supposed to be a rather liberal segment of the right. But for any practical purpose, it is aligned with the other two forces. Fujimorismo, we know a bit about it. Renovación eh, Popular is, is a party more clearly associated with this global trend of radical right. For instance, its leader and the current major of Lima, uh, Lopez Aliaga, he himself compared, uh, or he compared himself to Bolsonaro, for instance. Um, and he did support uh, Trump. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of the left, we had Peru Libre, the party under which uh, Castillo ran for the presidency, although he was not previously a member. Peru Libre allegedly is a Marxist-Leninist party. When you actually see how it works, it's mostly the business of the Serron family. Uh, Vladimir Serron, his brother, his mother, and uh, they are actually quite pragmatic uh, in many areas. I mean, when, when it comes to uh, public transportation or higher education, they do side with the right uh, asking for less government regulation rather than more, if you can imagine that from a radical left-wing party, allegedly. You had the, the group, um, I mean, the, the second round, the program that uh, Castillo presented was not the original program of uh, Peru Libre, which, as I said, was Marxist-Leninist or defined the party as such and proposed to expropriate most uh, well, I mean, businesses in what they call the strategic sectors of the economy. He presented a far more nuanced program, more social democratic, whose main objective was a, a fiscal reform. I mean, a reform that would increase uh, tax collection as a proportion of GDP, make the taxing system uh, more progressive and use uh, the new revenues for social programs. The thing is that when he came to power, he, didn't, he applied neither. N neither the radical program of the first round nor the moderate program of the second round. I mean, there's nothing progressive about his government. He wasn't progressive on social issues. He was against gender perspective on education, or at least part most of his party. He was against uh, the right of a woman to uh, choose in, 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 in matters of abortion. He was against sex, same sex marriage. But he was also against more radical redistributive, redistributive policies, or at least he didn't even try to apply any of them. He didn't rene renegotiate uh, or try to do that uh, contracts in extractive industries like, um, like Evo Morales did. Mm -hmm. He didn't apply the, the, he didn't push for the fiscal reform or, or, uh, that, that was in his plan. Right. Uh, he didn't do anything, I mean, right. that could be left-leaning in, in matters of economic policy. 
Great, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, let's we well, let's open it to a few questions from the audience. We've got some interesting questions. Let me ask um, both Cynthia and Farid, and if Roxana wants to weigh in, a question from uh, Peter Kornblum, which is whether this um, statement or position of Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, and Bolivia, uh, if you think it has any effect on the uh, how the government's handling of the crisis or any effect on the the protests and what's happening. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think it does uh, have an effect. I think it uh, provides support you know, for the, the protesters. I mean, obviously, this is you know indirect, and I think it does uh, worry the Boluarte government. I think they, not surprising, would like to be recognized. I think I've seen statements in which they emphasize that the European Union, you know, the other Latin American countries, the United States, have, have uh, recognized uh, Dina Boluarte. So I, I think they do uh, worry. I'm not sure it sort of affects the government, but it's like, you know, I I think we all three have expressed this surprise that or, or concern, you know, that um, and what it means too for Latin America going forward. There are all these pressing issues, and when there's uh, lead presidents who are kind of so willing to go so far out in a direction without looking at kind of the internal dynamics in the country and how this is going to affect it, I think it's 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 worrisome, and I think we hear that in the, in the discussions from from Peru. Great, thanks. Fari, do you wanna? Um, um, yeah, but on, on the other hand, uh, it didn't help. Uh, you you realize that the, the government didn't want to open itself another uh, another conflict with foreign governments. So the 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 response was the official response was quite subdued. But I mean the fact that the the a statement by those four governments does not mention the attempted coup, the, 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 att the attempt by Castillo to put all state powers under his rule and rule by decree, that disqualifies what they, anything else they might have said that might be reasonable. Right. Do you see, there's another a related question from Gabriel Soto here whether all of that's happening, the blockages of roads, the attacks on infrastructure, violence, um, compare, says it makes a comparison to what Colombia saw in 2021. Do you see any transnational connection beyond Peru to what's happening? Um, is there any sign of that or anybody? I, have, I haven't seen any, any sign of it. I mean, I think the underlying, you know, factors of, you know, this anger at the poverty, inequality, exclusion, um, you know, Chile too, you know, the extent to which is something you wouldn't think would ignite such severe protests, uh, build on previous, you know, frustrations. I think that's the common, you know, dynamic. Okay. Well, on the same topic, uh, also there has it has been said, and by none other than the uh, chief of the Direction Against Terrorism in the Peruvian police, that the Shining Path and the Movimiento Revolucionario Tupac Amaru were behind the violence. In the case, I mean, they just cannot conceive a protest that might be widespread without a clear leadership. There must be a mastermind behind it, either the uh, Foro de Sao Paulo or uh, the, the terrorist organization. Just, just to make it plain, the Movimiento Revolucionario Tupac Amaru has not been accused of a single terrorist attack since last century. And the US government took it off its list of terrorist organizations in 2004, not because it ceased to be a terrorist organization, but because it doesn't exist anymore. And yet you have the leader of the anti-terrorist unit in the police blaming a non-existent organization uh, for the violence now. The same with the Shining Path. The Shining Path under that name does not exist anymore. No group vindicates the name Shining Path today not Moladev, not the so-called Militarizado Partido Comunista del Peru. So basically, this is just an attempt to uh, uh, instill fear and hatred in a segment of public opinion that 
with good reason, uh, basically has uh, painful memories of the period in which the Shining Path and the MRTA were uh, acting as terrorist groups. Mm -hmm. Let me add something here, um, which I think it is very important, uh, both economically and politically, which is the prevalence in Peru of illegal economies and of the informal sector in general. So you have illegal mining, uh, you have uh, drug dealing, you have several, uh, and even what can be seen as what should be legal activities as housing for the poor is uh, following uh, Aisha Holland's uh, book, uh, Redistribution by Forbearance. And so um, you have all these groups of people which have tons of money, uh, uh, which who can finance uh, this kind of uprisings and you have the chief of police for some reason. I don't want to, to think it is just mere incompetence uh, saying it is uh, because of the shining path. And so there are other issues that we tend not to bring into the fore because uh, studies of illegal economies are really uh, risky to undertake because you, you are risking your own life. I, I, uh, illegal, illegal logging and what is going on in, in new areas in the Amazon. So it's, it's much more complicated. And those monies are the, one, are the resources that some political parties have for campaign financing. And so it's much more complicated. Let me ask, uh, there's a, there's, let me just combine a few questions from, uh, we don't really have much time, but let me just try to end with this because it, it, I think, combines a few questions is, there is, a, and we get this, for a lot of journalists as well kind of raise these questions about, you know, are these, you know, has the, has the judicial system become so politicized? And Congress obviously has this, as I had this antagonistic relationship with Castillo from the beginning. You know, it, it, are these investigations of corruption really kind of independent and credible and objective? Or, or, or is there really a political uh, agenda that's driving the prosecutors and so forth? And how do we understand that? Cynthia, you're, you're nodding. Do you want to? <laughs> yeah, it, it's a really important uh, question. I, I think there are definitely very honest, very unpoliticized uh, prosecutors and, and, and judges in Peru, but I also think that uh, we have seen quite a bit of politicization and, and that that's you know, worrisome. I, I was very hopeful a couple of years back, but I think and this relates to some of the things that Roxana and Ferry were saying too, now that so many different influences and so much political turmoil and the capacity for co-optation. Uh, and I think this is a factor too in the protests, as I mentioned before, there've been you know, a lot of charges, but uh, the use of the plea bargain, for example, I mean, it, it's been very necessary to achieving you know, many of these charges and many of them are very valid, but it's also clear that a lot of the time uh, these quote witnesses are saying things that are only helping them and then it's in the news and that so it creates the impression perhaps that corruption is even worse than it is. And you know, again, that's a factor in these protests with people kind of saying it's just everywhere and you know, case of my adults, no? So. Right. Um, a very quick final question for Fari. Do you think this president's going to survive this crisis, the protests? That's a quick question, but then. Yes or no? Huh? I'm not sure. I do not know. I have no okay. clue. Okay. But I am doubtful. Okay. Great. Thank you. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I'm sorry for those who asked great questions, weren't able to get to them. That shows that there's a lot of interest, a lot of questions, and we'll have to just do more events and more discussions. And But this has really been superb. Uh, I want to thank uh, Roxana. I want to thank Fareed and, of course, Cynthia for great comments and really illuminating what's a very, very complicated but a very serious situation that we'll be following uh, very closely. I want to thank Rebecca as well for her support and Gaston. And just uh, just a final reflection of my own um, 
you know, I wrote an article. I'd lived in Peru for four years and left in um, 1991, 1992. And I wrote an article uh, about uh, Peru and uh, for a magazine called Debate in those times. And uh, I started the article with one, only one word, which was precarious. Um, and that was my sen overwhelming sensation during the time I lived in Peru. And uh, 30 years later, uh, I have the same sensation. So, um, you know, a lot has changed uh, over those 30 years and a lot, I think, for the better in many respects. We shouldn't lose sight of that. But in the political realm, uh, there is a, this sense of precariousness uh, persists. Um, but we all hope uh, that this is going to, that this, things will settle down, will calm down, and there won't be more deaths. Um, there won't be more violence. There won't be more people injured because the toll has already been too high and uh, we should really focus uh, on that uh, above all, I think at this point. So again, thank you all very, very much. We'll keep in touch and uh, really appreciate your participation. Thanks to all of our participants uh, in the session and uh, we'll continue to look for other dialogue events on Peru as well as other issues going forward. So thank you, take good care and happy holidays to